Gary Richardson. I was born March 17, 1937 in Seattle. And at the very first part of my life, we lived, I think, for two years in Rainier Valley and then moved to West Seattle at 45th and Walker Street. And I was raised there, went to Lafayette grade school, James Madison Junior High School and West Seattle High School. Right after high school, I joined the Navy and was gone for two years in South Texas and then came back and went to the University of Washington and uh, graduated from there in 1961. Let's see, what else? <laughs> My folks had a um, summer home and my mother had bought the property on Vashon Island waterfront in 1927 and was making payments of 50 cents a week on the property. And this, my grandfather in 19, I believe 35, built the cabin there, the original cabin. And we spent every summer over there, my brother and I and our uh, friend Bob Larson, and we was just, I know, three, all within, my brother was 22 months younger than I, and Bob was in between the two of us, so we were pretty good guys. Pretty, we had a lot of fun. During World War II, this is a certificate that was issued by the United States Coast Guard to my mother so that we could operate a 12-foot rowboat on Vashon Island. You could not have binoculars or a camera or anything else in there for fear that it could leak secrets to the enemy. And this little license right here is issued by the Coast Guard to my mother. She had to carry that all the time. This is the certificate that tells you what you can do and you can't do and all of that other business. So that's a little bit of old Vashon Island history. I remember the start of World War II. I was four years old. We had been on Sunday, we had gone to Vashon for the weekend, lived in West Seattle. And I remember going up in the driveway at my grandparents' house which was on Myrtle Street right off of California Avenue. It was just a short drive to the ferry dock in Fauntleroy. Anyway, I remember pulling up there and my grandfather Smith coming out, this is my mother's dad, coming out on the front porch and yelling out, Norm, the goddamn Japs bombed Pearl Harbor this morning. <laughs> That's the first we had heard of it because back then, you didn't have radios in cars. You know, we didn't even have electricity at the cabin on Vashon. And that lamp, which Sandra would quit reading and bring the lamp over here, I could... That was one of the sources of... This is one of the sources of light in our cabin over there. I think the fuel, which was probably coal oil, is all dissipated now, but this was how we read and you had light after dark in the cabin before electricity. So anyway, my, my grandfather filled my mother and dad in on what was going on and I of course, my brother was just a couple years old, but I was a big shot at four. And uh, so anyway, I do remember that quite a bit. And that was one of the uh, memories I have of, of World War II. I also, at the time, we lived in the Admiral Way District in West Seattle. I thought Elliott Bay was Pearl Harbor. And when we would get in the car to go somewhere. I was just petrified that we were going to go to Pearl Harbor, which of course is in Hawaii. But I, as a little kid, you envision that with all the ships down there and whatnot. And that was before there was any of the big Boeing facilities. There used to be a big factory down where 
Well, it's where the um, Old Rainier Brewery is. It was a big Boeing factory in the plant in there. And uh, at that same time, 1941, late 41 or 42, the U.S. Army came to my grandmother Richardson's house, which happened to be on Rainier, it's on the hill up behind Boeing Field, and it's, there's a, uh, what do they call that, the bluff up there anyway. At the time, there was fear that the Japanese were going to bomb Boeing Field, which is where all the, f so they put up barrage balloons. These were hung on, these were on cables. They were like a dirigible is what they were. And they had to hold them down in the ground somewhere. So they came in to my grandmother. She didn't even know what they were talking about. She got hold of my dad. He came because he actually owned the two acres there on Beacon Hill. And uh, they dug a couple of big holes and filled it with concrete and anchors to hold this barge, this balloon down. Now the theory was that was that they couldn't swoop down low enough to do too much damage if these balloons were up there high enough. I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it's how they did it. It's what the thinking was. And uh, somewhere in some papers I have up in the attic, there is the settlement by the government after my dad sued him for not removing the concrete after the war was over. And they came in and did it. But he threatened to take them to court, and, and uh, they they just, no, no, it's fine. Well, the land was no good where this concrete was. You had to get rid of it. What, what do you, you know, <laughs> big, huge concrete. Anyway, they came in and took them out. So that's another little bit of information back then. Well, during World War II, we lived at the, like I said, the Admiral Way District of West Seattle. And we were at the uh, 45th and Walker. At about 49th and Walker, there you ran into Sunset Avenue, which was at the time overlooking the entrance to Elliott Bay. And the military came in and put some huge gun emplacements. And I think some of those guns were about the size of these ones at Fort Casey over here. And as during the war, you didn't get candy, but we'd go down there, a group of us, about six guys, kids, and the soldiers would give us candy bars because they got them. And uh, it was pretty interesting. It was uh, quite a time in, in history. And uh, when, of course, when that, when the war was over and the military moved out and everything was reverted back, uh, that became some pretty prime real estate. It's got some beautiful homes down there now. I mentioned my grandpa Smith, and his their original name was Schmitz, but they changed it to Smith, and it was Nicholas Smith. And this is a deed for a section of land signed by Theodore Roosevelt when this was the land grants back then. So this is a pretty good, they weren't from Canada. My, this is my mother's folks. My dad's folks were from England and they came through Canada. But um, I guess that's got both sides mixed up, right? Part of the, um, uh, I guess you could say uh, history <clears throat> is that the rifle, my dad bought that when I was born. So this is going to be 82 years old here next March. And it's a 22 caliber. And this was one of the first ones when they loaded through here. And this was my gun now all the time I was growing up. And it's the only one I've kept of all the guns we've had over the years, this one, because it's so, I guess, you know, it's old, it's an antique. And uh, there's no, I have bullets for it, but I've got them in a completely different place. So there's nothing, nothing valuable, you know, or no way that's gonna get. So that's an old gun. The, uh, 
my dad was a butcher and during the days when there back then there was bartering done bartering is when a butcher such as my dad would go to somebody's place and kill a pig or a cow or whatever cut it all up and wrap it and then in exchange for that rather than money they would give him something well anyway this is how he acquired this bow which is you can see it'll it is flexible and it'll bend but you can see the design on it that the uh, Native Americans painted on it I think he got it believe it or not from a guy a Japanese guy on Vashon Island by the name of Matsumoto and he, how he got it I don't know but that's where that came from now these are from an actual native of Indian from the from the um, banks of the Columbia River. These are fish spears. And if you look at them, and they're all weighted, balanced, you can see how they're, how they're made so that they are really pretty. You get a fish hooked on one of these and I don't think you're going to get it off too easy. But this is what the, the uh, Columbia River Indian tribes used to get fish way, way, way back. Uh, somewhere and I don't know where it is I've seen a I've seen a picture of them on a, what would you call it I guess like almost like a dock but it's up high and they threw those things off at the yeah the rocks are on these and speared the fish pulled them back up and oh, this this rocking chair is from the Civil War and to my knowledge, it's never been reupholstered or anything else. Um, it's, it's actually in remarkable condition for having been in, well, it's been in the attic here for 18 years uh, at this house. And it was in the shop attic on Vashon for years. That would have been probably 20 years. So it's been in storage for 38 years, basically. I had it in the back room here briefly till I caught the kids dinking around with them too much, jumping on it and whatnot. And, and uh, that was when they were little, the grandkids. So anyway, that's the story. It's from the Civil War. Wrong side of the war from England. They weren't, the English weren't in the Civil War, Sandra. Well, it was originally, originally they were from Germany, Grandpa Schmidt, Schmitz, but they changed their name. His folks changed their name to Smith way back. I mean, this would have been before World War I. One of my other memories of Vashon Island as a youngster were, was the fact that uh, ships were refitted and worked on in Seattle and every once in a while something would break loose from one of them and float around and there so happened to be a balsa wood life raft. Now balsa wood used to be all you could get to make airplane model airplanes out of and so my dad salvaged this raft and on this raft was this stuff. This is a can of biscuits so this would be made in the 40s, early 40s. This is a can of water, still full, from the same time. And this was the distress signal that was on that raft. So the, they were in, tr on, if the ship got sunk and you were in the raft, you could release this and it must have been smoke of some kind that went up so they could find you. So that's that. And this is just a 69 cent jar of coffee that was in the cabin 
back then, and it's I don't want to be tempted to take one of those coffee bags out and see if it tasted any good, but it's it's this is this has got to be 70 years old, at least. Oh, that little stool was mine when I was a kid, and I believe I also had a high chair that was all wood, and. Back then, things were made of real wood. They weren't pressed board, they weren't plywood or anything. It was real solid wood. And uh, that little stool downstairs is uh, a pretty good example of something that survived this many years. When I, you know, when I was maybe three or four when I got into it. So it's 78, 79 years old. Yeah, that china cupboard was made by my Grandpa Smith's dad, so it would have been my great grandfather, made that, and it was made out of dunnage. And dunnage is what they used to put in the holds of ships to give it ballast or whatever you want to call it. So when the ships were failing, sailing from Paris, from well, I don't know, didn't want to go to Paris, but from uh, England to France and they needed to have some ballast for weight or what that's what they put in there so that's what this and it's it's pretty much oh it's beautiful wood it's gorgeous wood and that of course was done before there was any sort of uh, power tools I mean that was all hand done Jenny had that in her house down in Centralia and they had new glass put in it because the glass from back then would st still, it wasn't cracked, but it was wavy. You, you could, you know, the old glass was all wavy. So anyway, that was, that's what that's about in a china cupboard. Maybe we'll be telling you guys about the barrage balloons. Here's the deed, the real estate contract between the Williams family that owned it and my dad to buy it, the north two acres of lot 20 blah, blah, blah. This is the, for the two acres that that they had put those uh, concrete blocks in. That's my brother that died when he was, when I was 16, he was 14. Uh, he fell on a log and smashed his head pretty good. And Farmer's State Bank of Sanish, Sanish, North Dakota. My mother's bank account when she lived in North Dakota. Lots of old junk here, you guys. You know where Sound Tractor used to be? The Kubota dealer in Everett? I bought my tractor there. They carried the contract. That's my dad. That's his citizenship. This, I guess, is the original because it's stamp got a big fancy stamps on it. And it Certificate of Citizenship naturalized citizenship this 26th day of December 1931 <laughs> that was I think it was the precursor to the Boy Scouts but it was the I think the Canadian version of it see that's from the Boys Brigade that my dad was in in the I guess it would have been the early 1900s 1915, yeah, he'd he was born in 03, so he would be, what, 12 years old. Boys Brigade, 2nd Winnipeg Company. This is a trophy I won for the B-Class Roadster Championship, the National Hot Rod Association, in 1955 in uh, uh, Scapoos, Oregon. So that's where the regionals were held. It's a 31, 1931 Model A Roadster that was channeled down over the frame and then I had a full race Merck flathead engine in it with two four barrel carburetors, which it was a V8 and it, uh, so you had a barrel feeding each cylinder. It's a pretty good car, pretty fast. When I graduated from high school, my friend Bill Wines and I decided to drive to California and we took my car. And 
the roadster that we had I, I'd won that championship with, and uh, we were in uh, California, right by Lake Shasta, and we were we we noticed a a, a Buick pulled over to the side of the road, and this was an older Buick. And I think it might have been a 1939 or 40. Anyway, there was an elderly couple in it, and here's a couple of smart, 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 you know, high school kids. And we pulled over and said, "What's the trouble?" And the guy said, "Well, I can't shift the car." And uh, so we had a toolbox. When you have a car like that Roadster, you had to have a toolbox with you, and parts and whatnot. And we. Um, so Bill and I figured out what had happened, and there are, used to be cotter pins which held the linkage on to the transmission to, to shift it with. Well, he'd lost the cotter pins. And so we fixed it, and just as we were getting finished, a policeman pulls up. It's California State, you know, state trooper. And uh, what's going on here? He thought we might be hassling this older couple. The guy said, no, they're great. Those guys have just fixed my car for me. You're kidding. He said, no, and the cop starts looking at my car, and he said, uh, did you build this? I said, yeah, most of it. And he said, uh, how fast will it go? I said, I have no idea. He said, I tell you what I'm going to do. He said, at the top of the hill, there's a signboard, and I'm going to go from that signboard exactly one mile, and I want you to start at that signboard and go past me, and I'll clock you how fast you're going. I said, now you're going to give me a ticket. He says, no, I'm not. I promise you I won't. Well, anyway, he clocked me, and it was I was doing 154 miles an hour, and that's in 1955. That's a lot of fa that's pretty fast for that age that oh. year. <laughs> so anyway, that was my story of that one. Okay, this is I guess I call it the wood shop. These are just an accumulation of tools from over the years. Hatchets and axes. You know what that black handle thing is? That's a bolt cutter. Cut, cut paddle locks off of lo lockers and they have those at the Y. Because <laughs> people lose their keys all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know. There's a, a brass hammer right there. And that's an old grindstone from the uh, Nettleton Mill in West Seattle that just, you cranked it and you could sharpen stuff on it. Non-electric. And then, now watch your step when you come past here because there's a little curb right here. This grinder right here was a sales price, my dad prize, my dad won. And I gotta think it was about 1950. So this thing's old, this grinder. And it, uh, believe it or not, it still works if I turn this switch on. Isn't that cool? That's old. This is an explosion proof telephone. We used to sell these when I was at Annexter a hundred a zillion years ago. And this has, doesn't create any sparks, but it's for down in mines, so there's no explosions. So that's what this is. It was a sample, and they were going to throw it away. I said, wait a minute, I'll take it. Pick it up if you want to pick up something heavy. And this is just a bunch of nuts and bolts and screws and cotter pins and all those drawers that got something in them. Okay, that's shop number, I don't know what it is, wood shop. There's a uh, four different size ball peen hammers up there. Remember that um, horse's head that was on the aluminum from the other day? That's a ball peen hammer. That's what you push those little, put those little round holes in. The levels, the six foot level is uh, just a, it's a long level. Get everything square up and down. The one next to the uh, orange, or, <coughs> orange one up there 
is a masonry, brick masons use those kind of levels. That's a straight edge for cutting sheetrock. Plasterboard in a house, you just lay that on it and scribe and pop it off. So, well, some of this stuff, they're out of business. These yardsticks. A lot of these people are out of business. I'll bet you guys have never seen, believe it or not, that's a measure. But it's metal. It's all rusty now. It needs to be cleaned up. I should take it over to the grinder, but sometimes you do more damage with these cleaning them than there, you know, than you should. But back here, I was telling you about my grandpa Smith that yelled at my dad about the Japs bombing Pearl Harbor. This vice down here was his, and it's a machinist's, heavy duty machinist's vice. Not this one, this is a corner, corner vice, but get it? Well, I'll be glad we get that new furnace. We, this is heated when the furnace is running. Okay, this is the paint shop and winter storeroom for uh, all of the yard art that people's liable to steal. There's also a radial arm saw in here that doesn't work, and all of these clamps and saws and whatnot that I've used over the years, extra blades for the saws. And then we were talking we were talking about, I think, planes the other day. There's a set of planes that are, that one big one's worth a couple hundred dollars. Those big long planes. But uh, I mean, it used to be, I don't know, nowadays they got everything as electric, so I don't know. But it's just full of all kinds of stuff. That cupboard has all kinds of paint in it and stains and whatnot. You saw the planes in the other room on the wall? Well, these are the ones that were made before that. They're wood. <laughs> Piece of maple. And these are, there's one, I don't know, two or three of them in here. These are uh, big time. These are, these are worth some money, I think. But this <coughs> is a, uh, old claw hammer. This is one of the original Yankee drills. You can see there's a, a big plane there. There's some over here. It's a huge plane. Um, this is a, believe it or not, quarter inch electric drill from way, way, way back. One of the very first ones they ever made from Nettleton. When I worked there at night, they were getting rid of a bunch of stuff. This What's metal? Timber Company, West Seattle. This is a molding cutter. This is the type of thing that was used to make that uh, cabinet downstairs. That fancy ch ch china cupboard down there. That's what this type of stuff was made for. Level. This is your uh, instruction manual. Pocket level. Tape there. Oh, wow. Metal. And those are, this is a, uh, these are compasses. Here. For scribing. Okay, that's all there was back here. Nettleton Timber Company burned the office and part of one of the uh, uh, storehouses, storerooms, and uh, I went down to clean them up and clean up. And as we were cleaning up, uh, the Ben Gardner, that was the president, said, "You know, any of this stuff that's laying around here, you want take if you think you can use it for anything." And so. I grabbed that nail puller up there and 
I don't know, some other stuff down there, that original old Yankee drill and some of that kind of stuff. So that's it.